Okay, this talk is uh, on Isaiah chapter 2, and um, we'll be going through the whole chapter. So first of all, it's a fascinating chapter. Uh, the prophecy is full of hope, pointing to a glorious age, an age of peace and order where you can live without a great deal of worry, without the fear of war, and yet it's also a prophecy of condemnation, quite, quite severe condemnation, and it points out some real problems in, in society at the, at the time, and I think a lot of it is also valid today. Um, it offers some correction, and it closes with an earth-shattering statement about man. So let's have a look at uh, what Isaiah chapter 2 is, is all about. Um, I think it is a message for today. I think it is a message for, for especially for Europe, America, you know, for the... Uh, uh, the Christian Occident, um, as it has decayed dramatically over the last generation. So let's have a look at what uh, Isaiah, Isaiah 2 is all about. Okay, I'm reading from chapter 2, and it says, uh, The word that Isaiah, the son of Amos, saw concerning Judah and Jerusalem. Now it shall come to pass in the latter days that the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established on the top of the mountains and shall be exalted above, above the hills, and all nations shall flow to it. Many people shall come and say, Come, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of God of Jacob. He will teach us his ways, and we shall walk in his path. For uh, out, of the, out of Zion shall go forth the law, and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. He shall judge between the nations, and rebuke many people, and they shall beat their swords into plowshares, and their spears into pruning hooks. A nation shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they, shall they learn war any more. And uh, I'm going to go to the next part, and it's, chapter f uh, it's verse 5, chapter 2. And it says, O house of Jacob, come and let us walk in the light of the Lord. For ye have forsaken your people, the house of Jacob, because they are filled with eastern ways. Uh, they are soothsayers like the Philistines, and they are pleased with the children of foreigners. Their land is also full of silver and gold, and there is no end to their treasures. Their land is also full of horses, and there is no end to their chariots. Their land is also full of idols. They worship the work of their own hands, that which their own fingers have made. People bow down, and each man, is hum each man humbles himself. Therefore do not forgive them. Enter into the rock and hide, hide in the dust from the terror of the Lord and the glory of his majesty. The lofty looks of men shall be humbled, and the haughtiness of men shall be bowed down. And the Lord alone shall be exalted in that day, for the day of the Lord of hosts shall come upon everything proud and lofty, and upon everything lifted up, and it shall be broad low. Upon all the cedars of Lebanon that are high and lifted up, and upon all the oaks of Bashan, upon all the, the high mountains, upon all the hills that are lifted up, upon every high tower, upon every fortified wall, upon all the ships of Tarshish, and upon all the beautiful slo sloops. The loftiness of men shall be bowed down, and the haughtiness of men shall be brought low. The Lord alone will be exalted in that day, but the idols he shall utterly abolish. They shall go into the holes of the rocks, and into the caves of the earth, from the terror of the Lord, and the glory of his majesty, when he arises to shake the earth mightily. And that day a man will cast away his idols of silver and his idols of gold, which they made for, the, for himself to worship, to the moulds and buds, to go into the clefts of the rocks and into the cracks of the rugged rocks from the terror of the Lord and the glory of his majesty. When he arises to shake the earth mightily, sever yourselves from such man, whose breath is in his nostrils, for, what, for of what account is he? Okay, that was the, uh, the whole chapter, and you can see distinctly that there are two parts. There's one about the day of the Lord, when the day of the Lord comes. And the, the main thing is, when you look at the day of the Lord, everything is lifted high. You know, people are arrogant, they, uh, they've built themselves, you know, interesting things and high ideas and their own religions. But when God comes, all this comes to nothing. So that's the second part. And the first part is, uh, is again, it's a criticism of uh, of God having forsaken his nation, God having forsaken his people, and 
And yet it's a promise as well of his power and of his presence being right in amongst his people. Um, so it's, it's interesting. Yeah. Okay, anyway, let us um, have a look at uh, the, first, the first part, and I'm just going to read it again. Now it shall come to pass in the latter days that the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established on the top of the mountains, and it shall be exalted above the hills. And all nations shall flow to it. Many people shall come and say, Come and let us go to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob. He will teach us his ways, and we shall walk in his path. For out of Zion shall go forth the law, and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. He shall judge between the nations, and rebuke many people, and they shall beat their swords into plowshares, and their spears into pruning hooks. And nation shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war any more. Okay, so that's the first part, and it's, it's a really strong message, and it's a really nice message as well. You know, God is here right amongst us. He will tell us what to do, which way to go, and uh, the need for war totally disappears. It's just no longer there anymore, and it shall come to pass at the end. Okay, let's have a look at, uh, at a little bit, you know, look into this. Now, there's one verse which sticks out here, and, and it's called, They shall beat their swords into plowshares. The spears into pruning hooks, and nation shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war any more. Uh, the first thing which came to mind when I, when I, when I did this was that uh, a few years before I became a Christian, I was really active in, the, um, in, in Germany, in uh, the, uh, the peace movement, or the so-called peace movement. But all it came down to it was just uh, trying to create peace, trying to create peace without God. And, and one verse they um, they took was to beat your swords into plowshares. Schwerter zu Flugscharen in German it was called. And um, and that stood on. You had like little bumper stickers and they were all over the place. And I think most people didn't realize that it that it was actually a verse which came straight from the Bible. Uh, obviously they wanted to take this and, uh, you know, uh, demonstrate for peace and uh, encourage peace. And that was at the time when... Um, we had this nuclear madness between the East and the West where both sides could pretty much obliterate the Earth about four or five times by uh, letting loose all the nukes. Um, anyway, that was, that was at that time when this came up and it was a real, real strange feeling at the time and, and I'm not sure how old you are. If you lived through the 80s, um, the early 80s, you, you would have probably picked up some of it where people weren't sure whether whether next year was was still gonna gonna be um, be an option. We we're still gonna be here. Uh, anyway, the thing the peace movement got wrong at the time is this little verse here and all the stuff which goes ahead of this verse. And it's always a problem when you take the Bible and you pluck one one statement out, one verse out, and you try to make it your own but you forget about the things which are written before it and, and after it. The key to peace here is um, that God is ruling in Jerusalem, that he is controlling the world, and that the nations will come to him for advice, for, um, for, for learning the ways of God. And, and it goes even further, God will judge between nations, and he will rebuke many people. So it doesn't sound like, a pat on the shoulder or anything like that. So it sounds pretty uh, gruesome as well what happens, where God, where God will just say, look, enough is enough, this isn't right, you do this, you do that, and, and you know, here's peace now. It's a bit like parents as well, when you've got a few naughty kids, eventually you have to interfere, you have to, you know, create some order in your family, tell both of them off and, uh, and make them to shake hands afterwards to stop them from escalating and, and fighting one another and uh, going a little bit crazy. Now God is going to do the same thing and he will uh, create peace between nations. Now the key to peace in this world is not uh, us creating it and it's not us humans doing it, but it's really seeking God in, in everything and um, seeking divine intervention. And I would go even so far and say that, that a lot of problems we and a lot of conflicts we've been going through recently. Uh, what you need is, is is just God's wisdom, and and some of the wars I'm I'm totally convinced were were inevitable. That there was no way around it. There was so much grief between different people groups that the only way out was uh, to take up arms and to uh, you know to fight for what each people group thought was a was a right rightfully theirs. 
Um, but, but really, what you need is very often is divine inter intervention, the ability for people to forgive and to forgive their, uh, their enemies as well, and then to, to move on with life uh, for the best of everyone concerned around. Anyway, um, I want to stay with this thought a little bit further. Um, some time ago, I was on a ferry from, uh, from England to France, and I met a, a gentleman on this ferry, and he was a high-ranking official from the EU. Now, he was British, yeah, which uh, I thought was quite strange. There are not uh, that many high-ranking people. He uh, was very cr critical towards Europe and towards the, the European... Uh, he was very positive about Europe, obviously, because he was a high-ranking um, official. But, but most British people are very critical towards Europe and towards the European idea. And, and they're not quite sure what to do with this. They, they feel, and I live in Britain myself, so I get some of the sentiments, they feel they are somewhat uh, disentangled from the whole European process. And, and to be fair, a lot of people I've met in, in Europe, uh, like in Germany and, and elsewhere, um, they're okay with yeah, most of what Europe stands for, the free travel and the neighbors next door, but, but they're still, they still have got a very strong identity. So they wouldn't first consider themselves as European from the impression I had, but they would first consider themselves to be French, Belgium, Netherlands, uh, like Dutch or German or um, whatever else, um, whatever nationality they may be from. So um, in Britain, a little bit more, you know, they're separated, they're on an island and, and they don't like Europe very much and they don't like control from Europe at all. So even though that's my own view, I'm German, I live in Britain, enjoy a lot of privileges, uh, EU law has given me as a uh, European citizen living and within the European Union and within a, a foreign country. Uh, I don't like the European idea for many reasons. And so I had a, a, a bit of an argument with this gentleman. So he was, you know, hailing all the benefits of Europe and the European Union. And I was criticizing him all the time. Anyway, the discussion went on and we had this little bit of tit for tat. He said something, I said another thing, and I sort of tried to um, you know, turn it down. I respected the man. He was uh, many years my senior, so uh, I wouldn't confront him, but I would always sort of nip in a few things and say, yeah, but what about this and what about that? Um, in the end, he made one statement, and, and this pretty much silenced me, and he said, since the creation of the EU, within the territory of the EU, there's been no war. And that is unique in European history. And... I stopped, thought about it, and I thought, yes, he's right. Uh, when you look back in history, and you can go back almost a thousand years, uh, there's always been, there's been no, almost no generation in Europe where there hasn't been uh, some activity of war within, within the, the borders of the European Union. And so since its conception, um, war has not taken place either. And uh, when you look at it historically, the EU has been a success. Nevertheless, I still don't like the concept, and I still don't like that uh, there's a phenomenal amount of power in a small place uh, which is broadly non-elected, and, and they seem to control the governments of, uh, of Europe. Anyway, um, we did have conflict in Europe. We had conflict nevertheless, but that was outside the EU. There's been conflict in Yugoslavia, there's, con there's been conflict in, um, in, in the former territory of the Yugoslavia, like Bosnia, Herzegovina, and, uh, and other places. Uh, we, we still have some minor conflict in Moldova, Azerbaijan, Armenia, um, and, and other places, and, and no, Syria is not, not Europe. Um, some, some, you know, tension in Georgia, which is still uh, de facto in Europe. <coughs> but, but nevertheless, I mean, Europe has been relatively peaceful, and, and I was silenced a little bit. So the main point is, and, and, and this is one thing I, I learned from this and from this discussion, um, there's always been a desire for peace and for the absence of war. Most wars are based on some conflict between nations, and uh, we have... Um, national interests and, and ambitions of some ruthless and power-thirsty politicians sometimes. Most of the time it just seems to be pure greed which flames the momentum of war where uh, some people benefit from war to quite an extent and they, um, they, they, they try to keep it going. Uh, then we've got ideologies 
um, and, and for which people have fought for and lost their lives. So uh, we got the whole uh, series of proxy wars between the West and the East, where, where one side thought capitalism is the answer for everything, the other, the other side thought it's uh, inhumane um, uh, ideology and we need to promote communism as a, as a more humane idea. By, by having everybody equal and not having, um, you know, feeding the rich. Um, and then recently, communism slipped into insignificance in the 90s and suddenly, almost at the same time, the ugly face of jihadism uh, started raising its head. And we suddenly get uh, religious fanatics who uh, feel uh, their way to impose uh, what they believe in is obedience to um, to Islam or submission to Islam is through through terror and through uh, destabilizing uh, the biggest enemy, which is is the traditionally Christian West. I'm going to come on this point later. I think these guys are quite successful, possibly more successful than we um, we ever anticipated, and probably even they anticipated themselves. Um, the worst thing is that. Um, That everything, you know, when, whenever it comes to war, it seems to be that it's run by very few people, very few people indeed. It's not even a percent, percentage point of people who make these decisions and to lead nations into war, but it's even less than that. And, um, and they, they cause, you know, this damage and this untold damage and human, human effort. On the other side, the ideas, people... Um, um, where people use this concept to treat and start controlling big arenas of politics. So, um, and if you go back to the jihadism, we've got this huge problem that uh, a couple of guys have created a lot of damage, and, um, and a few others they jumped onto the opportunity and they um, created a political system which is much more restrictive than it's ever been before. A lot of the freedoms uh, we have enjoyed for at least two generations or one generation and. Many of our ancestors have fought for and died for, have just been swapped up. They've been mopped up with just a few, um, uh, a, f a few uh, sessions in Parliament or in, uh, in, in the House of Senate, is it in, in America? I'm not sure what it's called there, but, um, but just a few political decisions and a lot of freedoms have been taken, uh, taken away. I mean, we've got the Patriot Act in, uh, in America. We've got a lot of laws which have been giving untold powers to the police and to, to the government to, to start controlling and, and uh, incarcerating people. Okay, um, let me just see what happened here when we just go back with this jihadism. And it, it's just like one thing when you, when you look at the, uh, what's really happened here. Most people don't realize. They just think 9-11 and then we've had the 7-7 bombing in the UK where I think about 50 people died. Um, which, which is a tragedy, and there's no doubt about it. I'm not contesting this in the slightest. But what I'm contesting is the, uh, the, the proportionality of what happened there. Everybody knows about these two events, and it's burned into everybody's mind. And a lot of laws have been done, and millions of people have been affected. Uh, I was talking recently to somebody, every time you go through an airport, and you've got your little plastic bag, and you need to put your, your liquids in there. Um, it's just one example where... Um, where you think, okay, you know, something bad has happened, but now millions of people are affected in everyday life. Laws have changed, um, more controls have brought in, you can be arrested in the UK without, um, under the terrorist legislation, without uh, charge, they can just let you disappear for a month, nobody knows where you are. Yeah. Uh, this is not democracy anymore, this is not uh, a free society, it's um, the laws which have been put in place, they are laws of uh, of a, of a despotic society and of a, of a despotic government. Not of, they're laws of despotism, they're not laws of democracy. It's not what people want, it's not for the protection of the people either. Okay, let me just put this into, into perspective. So we've had these two events, 9-11, 7-7. Uh, the death toll is about 2,500 people. I'm not sure how many people were injured or crippled. Uh, the, the toll, uh, at a guess, I would say is quite high. Um, and, and let's have a look at some other statistics, just to get this into proportion. So in the UK, and this is only in 2012, we had 1,754 people who died as a result of a traffic accident. And this is pretty much an average figure. So if you uh, multiply this by 10 years, so this is just the UK, uh, an island of about 60 million people, 
We're looking at about maybe 20,000 people since 9-11, about there, yeah, which have died. So, okay, just put this in relation. We've had um, 50 people dying in the 7-7 uh, um, event where the, the metro bombings took place, um, 2,000 people in 9-11, and we've had 20,000 people, and that's just the UK, yeah, 20,000 people since, since that dying in traffic accidents. USA, in 2012, we had 33,808 people who died as a result of a traffic accident, and then obviously many more injured, crippled, you know, in hospital, um, possibly died later as a result of a traffic accident, but not as a direct result, only as an indirect result. So 33,000 people. If you assume this is an average figure since 9-11, we are looking at about 300,000 people. So that's about a city worth of people which have died due to traffic accidents. Yeah. 300,000 people as opposed to 2,000 in that event. event. So there's nobody's been taking a war or... Uh, I mean, I'm sure cars could be made a lot safer. I'm sure... Um, um, there's a lot of technology around now to, to, to reduce this figure even further. Uh, again, when we look at the USA, we've got about, I think it's 350, 400 million people living in the USA. UK is about 80 million, just to put, uh, not 80, 60 million, just to put this into relation. Ukraine, about 40 million people living there, and we had 5,000 traffic accidents, fatalities in 2012. Russia, we had 27,000, or it's 27,991, so a bit more. But then bearing in mind, we've got very strong winters and I would imagine uh, a lot of accidents happen during iced up roads and so on. In Germany, 80 million people in 2012, 3,657. Um, and worldwide, and we are just looking worldwide in 2012, is 1.2 million people have, have died. Okay, these are just traffic deaths. And this gives you just an idea, you know, there's not much legislation coming out to try and minimize traffic deaths. And, um, you know, we don't have, you know, be careful if you go into a car or anything like that. But the amount of legislation and the amount of stuff which has been done to try and minimize uh, so-called, um, um, whatever happened there, 9-11, whatever happened there in 7-7, um, doesn't really stand in any relation. So we're not looking at, at masses of, uh, of trauma. Yeah, there are more people who got traumatized because they lost a loved one uh, somewhere on the road uh, than, than that. Okay, as a direct result of 9-11, and we can look at two wars. There's the Iraq war, and I haven't looked at any figures for those, and there's the Afghanistan war, uh, which you could make an argument. It's a direct result of 9-11. There's an argument. Um, I know that, that uh, sort of looking at some documentaries, that even the Taliban didn't like bin Laden very much, and they were pretty much isolating him and put him de facto under house arrest, so he wasn't that free to move. But for some strange reason, you know, something happened there, two buildings went down, somebody had to suffer. So some government decided, right, let's go to war and uh, create some, some problems. Now, I'm not in favor of the, the Taliban government. I think these people are, are very severely misguided. I think, like anywhere else, they're just power greedy, power thirsty. There are a couple of people at the top who were in control, who were very rich. The ideas might have been somewhat noble, but the way they were executed was, was pretty gruesome, and it was pretty totalitarian. Anyway, so there might be a million reasons why to justify the Afghanistan war. There might be a lot of reasons to say uh, whatever happened there it, it doesn't really make any sense whatsoever. It would have been more appropriate if you follow the story of 9-11 to attack Germany, since a couple of these bombers were from Germany, than to attack Afghanistan, yeah, where all you had is a guy on a video, um, you know, taunting the U.S. and saying that uh, this is what they have done and uh, uh, congratulating them. Yeah, just one guy, yeah, and and that's pretty much what you had. And then the whole thing um, went and, and ended up in a war. Okay, let's have a look. So we have two thousand. That's a uh, that's a fatality. Two thousand people dead in um, in the states. A couple of years later, about 50 in the um, in the UK, and now we've got the Afghanistan war. Uh, the first rate is quite interesting. I had a look at the statistics. Um, that was in 2001. Uh, it is believed that in this rate, about 20,000 civilians died. 20,000. Yeah. Now, of course, they are Afghanis. You don't have all the media coverage. Um, they speak a different language. Uh, but nevertheless, they are people. They are mothers, children, fathers. They are people with uh, feelings, 
there are people who were fed up of the uh, Taliban as well. Some of them are probably Taliban and they embraced the regime, especially those who were in control and had some say. Um, and then in um, the annual after the war, you know, troops moved in, war took over, and um, civilian fatalities in, and I hope I got the figures right here, um, Ah, yeah. Coalition forces total to date. Yeah. So these are the uh, soldiers of the coalition who have died in this conflict, of uh, three thousand three hundred and eighty-nine. Yeah. In um, then going back to civilian f uh, fatalities in two thousand eleven, they reckon that three thousand civilians died, got killed in in Afghanistan as a result of the conflict, either through insurgents or through the coalition forces or through uh, collateral damage or whatever it is called. Yeah. So uh, again, the point I'm making is there every year, and apparently this 2012 was the first year where the figures have, have dropped down. Um, so that means every year there have been about, since it all started, uh, a similar figure, about 3,000. So we're looking at, um, at uh, fatalities, which civilian fatalities in, in Afghanistan. Um, I mean, obviously the figures, nobody really knows, I, I guess, but you're looking at about 50,000. Uh, you're looking at about, um, coming close to 3,500 soldiers. Um, and then what you're not looking at, and these statistics don't contain them, is all the people who got injured. And there are many of them who, uh, uh, who got into some crossfire, uh, got shot, lost limbs, and, and basically live the rest of their life as a cripple or severely ruined uh, or disabled in, 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 in trying to move forward. And again, those figures, they don't turn up here. Yeah, they are not, not in here. So this is only talking about people who have died. And again, when you look at this, 2,000 people in 9-11, and if you had just said, uh, okay, just forget about it, it was a big mistake. Um, obviously, the argument is there might have been more coming from it, but then on the other side, they didn't really get the guy who was responsible for it, but they got somebody else. They, they just raided a country um, under the uh, assumption that this country was harboring him. And in the end, he, he was in a different country. But... However you look at this, uh, you had one conflict, and whether it was justified or not, as a result of this one conflict, um, in revenge or in uh, sort of preemptive striking them so that there wouldn't be another 9-11 uh, happen happening or taking place, and again, you can sort of have a million arguments either side. Um, fact is, there are about 50,000 people who have died as a result of that, whether it was justified or not justified. It is gruesome, absolutely gruesome when I think about these figures. And, um, and, and it makes me almost sick to the stomach when I, when I think about all these people who have died in the process and whose lives have been ruined as, as a result of that. So the point I'm making is war is a reality. It comes all the time. You think, you know, everything is over. Russians and Americans, we are friends now. The Cold War is uh, put to rest and then suddenly a new conflict flares up and you end up with uh, a death toll of 50,000. Um, you know, on both sides, and, and most people who were affected by this were probably innocent anyway, and and had nothing to do with the conflict whatsoever. Um, okay, what is the point I'm making? The point is, it's madness. War is complete and utter madness, and we really need um, what we're trying here on, on, on Earth, in this world, is to try and find solutions to avoid war. One of these solutions has been the EU. Um, I, still, I don't believe that it is the best uh, way, and, and I think, you know, consolidating power in one area and then ruling over other nations. Uh, there are a lot of other things which have come out of it, which, which are very doubtful. A lot of laws which don't make a lot of sense. Um, but, but ultimately, you know, if God were in control, the creator of heaven and earth, the creator of man, the creator of this, this universe and this creation, um, things would be different. And, and Isaiah talks about this, you know. When, when Jesus will return, the Bible talks about two, two returns of Christ throughout the Old Testament. There, there, there's a, the, prophetically, the Old Testament looks at, uh, at uh, Christ appearing in weakness and it looks at Christ appearing in power. Now, when, when, when Jesus came, when the Messiah came, um, the Jews at the time were expecting somebody to free them from the Romans, and they were expecting Christ's return in power so that he would sit, or the Messiah would return in power, so that he would sit in Jerusalem, take over kingship, and um, you know, bring all this madness to, to rest and uh, judge between nations. Now, Jesus didn't come in power. He came in weakness. 
But when he comes back, he will come in power. And, and this is what this, this scripture is all about. He will sit down, he will take control, and he will rule between nations. <coughs> and all this madness will be over. And uh, instead of people dying needlessly, um, you know, not really achieving one thing or the other, um, war will be over and um, people will just carry on with their daily life, you know, enjoy life, have a good time, instead of killing others and being in danger of being killed themselves. Uh, I think the madness which we are suffering with war and, and throughout history is a result that man is in control. And it's not just man. Jesus in one instance calls the devil the prince of this world. And, uh, and the Bible talks about the devil that his aim is to, to steal and to destroy, to kill and to destroy. And, and I think we as people are often too willing servants, just too willing uh, to serve uh, the prince of this world in spurning on destruction of our fellow man and to, uh, to kill people who have been created in the image of God. And I think that is, that is what has been happening throughout history. Uh, I think about Napoleon, I think about Hitler, Stalin, <clears throat> and some of the stories are just absolutely horrendous. And, and, and you think what these guys did by marching hundreds of thousands of people into, into their death in, in, in a vain effort of controlling a bigger part of the world and of controlling more people. And it's, it's just all uh, just a madness which, uh, which is all around us. And, and unfortunately, unfortunately, innocent people get uh, get sucked up in this madness. So um, again, what, what is the answer? The answer is, is to yield to God, to really surrender to God. Pray for your politicians, that's one thing. Pray for the governments in control and pray that, uh, that God will put up boundaries for them to uh, avoid them doing stupid decisions which will lead, which will lead thousands of people into death. Um, there's a theory which I've once heard, and it says that the last 2,000 years uh, there hasn't been a single day of peace on this planet. And, and when I sort of look through history, uh, I'm not quite sure whether this is, this is actually true, but it's not far off, that's, that's for certain. So um, there may be a couple of days which was in between conflicts, but it seems that, um, that, that conflicts on this world for the last 2,000 years have been ongoing all the time. Um, so the fact remains, uh, as humans, as a human race, we cannot handle our affairs. Um, there's a lot of um, animosity between nations, between people. Uh, there are little wars in between ourselves, and there are big wars between, uh, between nations. And ultimately, they, they result in death and destruction. And, and it's, it's never good. It's never good when this happens. Um, I think it's safe to say if there's a war, there, there aren't any winners. Um, not really. The good news is so, and let me go back to this text, God is going to take over. The next time we have a problem as nations will uh, problem, nations will go to the throne of God and surrender grievances to him, and he will judge between nations. And, and obviously God being just, God being omniscient, um, we, can, we can trust God that, that he will make the right decisions and that he will, he will do justice. Uh, we will not go to war, and we will not need to learn the art of war. So that's the good news as well. Um, I, I don't know where you live, in which country you live. Uh, when I grew up, I, we had conscription. So that means you had to become a soldier and learn how to kill. And it, it is not very nice, I, I tell you that, especially when I look at the conflicts my country has been involved with after, after that time. Not that I would have ever been in danger to be drafted into one of those, but they were not necessarily conflicts I would have anything to do with that. Germany wasn't under attack, and yet soldiers had to go to, uh, to fight strange wars in, in countries which were not really a threat to Germany at any one time. Um, Okay, it's just to finish, his, finish sort of this thought of, of this, this chapter, or the, not this chapter, but this part of the chapter. Once Jesus comes back, once he returns in power, he will be in control. People will know who he is. They will walk to him, and, and they, will, they will want to uh, go to Jerusalem, and they want to learn about the ways of God. Uh, God will be visible to all. Christ, or God, 
you know, manifested in Christ will be will be will be visible to all. Um, without sort of going too much further into the return of Christ, one thing we know is, and Jesus said this, that when he when he left, that he will come back again, the same way as he went away. He rose into heaven. He will descend, and he will come back, and he will take control. Our job is to live in expectation of this return as Christians, and. Very often this truth in the Bible is sort of forgotten or is kind of swept under the carpet. Um, but, but it is sure Jesus is going to come back again and this is as important and as valid a doctrine, not to just a doctrine, just a fact, as it is just that Jesus died for you and that you can find salvation if you put your trust in Jesus as a savior, as your savior. So it's important to, to, to bear this, this fact in, in your mind because Jesus will return and, and and as the time comes nearer, we will become clearer on what this looks like, and more and more scriptures will hopefully become clearer. But then on the other side, he could return today. There's enough scriptures being fulfilled, you know, what Jesus talked about his return, and that, um, that he could, before the talk finishes, he could be here. And um, Jesus could be calling back his own, and, and he might establish um, his kingdom yeah, soon. So live in the expectation of his coming back. And if you are not with Jesus and you haven't accepted him as your savior, then uh, there's a terrible message for you. And this is a criticism of, um, of the world around us and of you know, what people are doing. And let me, let me go through this, next, through this next passage and then uh, we'll finish with uh, chapter 2. I'm just going to read it again. It says here, O house of Jacob, come and let us walk in the light of the Lord. For you have forsaken your people, the house of Jacob, because they are filled with eastern ways. They are soothsayers like the Philistines, and they are pleased with the children of foreigners. Their land is also full of silver and gold, and there is no end of their treasures. Their land is also full of horses, and there is no end to their chariots. The land is full of idols. They worship the work of their own hands, that which their own fingers have made. People bow down, and each man humbles himself. Therefore, do not forgive them. Enter into the rock and hide in the dust from the terror of the Lord and the glory of his majesty. The lofty looks of men shall be humbled. The haughtiness of men shall be bowed down, and the Lord alone shall be exalted in that day. The day of the Lord of hosts. For the day of the Lord of hosts shall come upon everything proud and lofty, upon everything lifted up. It shall be brought low. Upon the cedars of Lebanon that are high and lifted up, upon the oaks of Bashan, upon all the mountains, all the high mountains, and upon all the, the hills that are lifted up, upon every high tower, and upon every fortified wall, upon all the ships of Tarshish, and upon the beautiful slopes, uh, the loftiness of men shall be brought down, and the haughtiness of men shall be brought low. The Lord alone will be exalted in that day, but the idol shall be, he shall utterly abolish. They shall go to the holes of the rocks, <coughs> and into the caves of the earth from the terror of the Lord, and the glory of his majesty when he arises to shake the earth mightily. And that day a man will cast away his idols of silver and his idols of gold, which they made, each for himself to worship to the molds and buds, to go into the clefts of the rocks and into the crux of the rugged rocks from the terror of the Lord and the glory of his majesty when he arises to shake the earth mightily. Sever yourselves from such a man whose breath is in his nostrils, for of what account is he? Okay, really strong and gruesome message, and yet it is a mirror of our society in the West, as I believe. Uh, Judah, for example, was God's chosen people at the time. He has chosen Jacob, he has revealed himself amongst the people of Israel. And then it says, and that's in verse 6, You have forsaken your people, the house of Jacob. So it talks about uh, God forsaking his people, the house of Jacob. And I tell you one thing, there's nothing worse than that. Yeah. You are chosen, you are elected, um, you have, um, as a nation, you've been called by God, you responded, and then suddenly you go on different ways. And we can see in a minute what those different, different ways are. And, and then God has abandoned you. He doesn't listen to you anymore. He's forsaken you. And if you are, uh, you, I'm sure you've heard the English term, God forsaken. If, if a place is God forsaken, it is it is very lonely, it is very bitter, and it is very dangerous as well. Let's have a look why God has forsaken them. And there are a couple of points you can work out from this text. The first one is <coughs> they've, um, 
um, they're filled with Eastern ways. Yeah. Eastern ways, Eastern mythology, um, in the days of Israel, it was around, they had uh, loads of crazy ideas. Um, they're like the Philistines, soothsayers, so they go into sort of magic practices and into strange forms of divination. Um, <coughs> in the end, it, it depends how you look at divination and things like that, but um, uh, again, biblically, I don't want to go too far into it from, you know, quoting one scripture after the other, but um, there were some stories with Paul that there was a girl who was uh, into divination and she was uh, walking behind Paul and saying that these are the servants of the Most High. But the problem was the spirit inside her. It wasn't the spirit of God. It was a demon who was, uh, who was proclaiming that. And, and Paul got fed up with that and he cast out the demon. Yeah, he, uh, and then from then on, the, her, she made a lot of money for her owner. She was a slave, that woman. And, and uh, she didn't make any money anymore. And uh, the, the owners got quite upset with Paul and uh, a lot of problems occurred. The point I'm making here is very often divination, and very often when people are um, sort of into this sort of thing, um, it, it's demonically inspired. And it's not from God, but it's from the other side. It's from the other kingdom where uh, uh, spiritual forces take hold of people and they give them some abilities which are beyond themselves. Um, they are pleased with the children of foreigners. And it sounds really terrible, doesn't it? It sounds almost like racism when you look at the scripture. You know, children of foreigners. Um, but again, you have to understand this in the cultural context. Now, Israel was a separated people. Uh, God has given them his law. He has given them his statutes. They were meant to follow God. The mosaic, mosaic law is very clear that it says uh, to um, sort of marry within, within the nation. And, and there was a reason for that as well. And the reason was that um, every nation had their own gods and their own ideas about God. And if in those days you, um, you take a woman from another nation, ultimately she will bring up the, 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 the children in a different faith, not in the faith um, of the living God, of the people of Israel, but in the faith of the Philistines. They went to soothing, as, as we can see here, or maybe, you know, the, the Eastern ways, which are full of um, mysticism and mythology. Um, and, and that is a problem. And, and anyway, at the time, Judah, they kind of, oh, it's okay, you know, anything goes. And, and they, uh, they've taken wives from other places. Now, the same problem as well in, in our day and age. Um, we have got a lot of people who get into, um, into soothing, into, into divination, into alternative religions. They open up to, to Hinduism, to Buddhism. And, um, and it's shocking. It's absolutely shocking. I mean, when you look on television and you look at what people really think and what they believe, they pretty much have abundant Christianity. You know, the God has chosen uh, the Occident. Let me say this. Let me be as bold to say this, and I am. He has chosen the Occident, he has chosen the West, he has chosen Europe to, uh, to, to move his gospel, to move the Word of God, the Bible, into Europe. Now, as Europeans, we've tried our best to, uh, to minimize the impact of the Word of God by uh, creating big institutions who, uh, who throttle and uh, suffocate the Word of God. But, but throughout the ages, God has been raising up people who uh, were going back to the Scriptures, who were translating them into the local languages, who were preaching. And if I only go back the last thousand years, uh, there wasn't a century where there wasn't a great voice of reason, a great voice, a great preacher of the Word of God in Europe or in America who, uh, who was preaching the truth, who was preaching the gospel, and who was, who was calling people to return to God. Um, and, and that has been amazing. The last thousand years is certainly full of that. And... And yet, in our generation, and it's quite interesting as well, I look at my, my mother's generation, who was born in the 30s, um, and when I look at her generation, they've been through the war, they've, they've had, been through hardship. The majority of them, as they grew up and they've been sticking to it as well, they, if they didn't believe in Jesus Christ and they didn't accept him as their Lord and Savior or surrendered their life to Christ, at least they had a, a healthy respect for, for the Word of God, for the Bible, whatever the Bible had to say. Now, something happened within that generation, in my generation, where the Word of God has been turned into something which um, 
at best is is a is you know a nice interesting book, a bit classical, but it's obsolete and it's not relevant for our age. That's that's what most people in my generation seem to think. But then, strangely enough, they they look at um, Eastern mysticism, they look at uh, you know these bizarre religions, paganism as well, which you know well from before before our day and age, uh, Eastern mysticism, and uh, and seem to embrace it as a valid alternative. You know, we've got pantheistic ideas of you know we are all God, God is in us all, and and, and all this stuff, uh, where God becomes a little bit less, we become a little bit more, and 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 so on. And they they embrace this wholeheartedly or you get into some sort of agnosticism nobody really knows what's going on the bible is irrelevant you know the people have been you know pushing the bible they were just all little wimps uh, i look at the anglican church here in england i look at the protestant church in germany and they have completely abundant seemingly abundant um, the basic basic concepts of the bible and, and they've replaced it with uh, with some twisted humanism which is, is very far removed from the bible these days and, and anyway, people look at these guys as authorities for the Bible, and yet uh, they've given it up. And they, hence, they cannot be an authority of what the Word of God entails and what the Word of God stands for. So we've got a big problem in our society, and the fruits, we are, we are seeing it now, we are harvesting it now, but people just haven't got a clue anymore. They've lost the, the moral compass, and I would go even one step further, and I would say they've lost um, the magnetism. Even if they've got a compass, they don't know where it's supposed to be pointing at. Yeah. This is how far it has gone. Yeah. Um, big problem in our generation. A very big problem. There are few people who return back to the Word of God, who return back to the Bible, who have got a concept of good and right, but the rest is just going all over the way. Um, one thing which I mention very often, which, which it really strikes me, it's really annoyed me, and I think uh, our nations will be paying for it as well, sooner or later, is the redefinition of marriage. Uh, how dare a politician come along and and assume the role of God? The word of God is very clear. A marriage is between a man and a woman and it's not between a man and a man or a woman and a woman. Understand why, you know, stuff happens and and so on and um, people, uh, well, politicians feel they have to protect certain arrangements of people living together. Which, in a way, I can understand, and in a way, I can um, can go along with that. But, but marriage, marriage is something completely different. There's a very clear description for that, and it goes further. I mean, marriage has been around for uh, as long as mankind exists, and has always been a definition of man and woman, and nothing else. And taking this away and 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 equalizing something else, which, from what I understand, not even the lobby, you know, the gay lobby has not even been asking for it. I I uh, I understand, at least in this country. It might be different in other countries. Um, but it was just in a quest of popularism, in a quest of, uh, you know, look at us, you know, we are much more liberal than everybody else. And, um, and they've pushed this legislation through. It's just absolutely crazy, absolutely crazy. And it goes further as well. I mean, I can see that there's religious persecution at the end of it. If uh, a church refuses to to provide a marriage for this uh, for this strange arrangement, um, because biblically it's not, it's not acceptable. Um, you will find that possibly in one or two parliaments uh, that these people will be persecuted and, and, and churches will be uh, forced in the underground. Again, uh, the point I'm making here is we've lost it as a nation, as Europe, as America, as um, South America as well. We've, we've lost the, the compass we are doing as we please best, and 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 it's not going to go very well. It goes further here, and it talks about the land is full of silver and gold, and there is no end to their treasures. And the land is full of horses, and there is no end to their chariots. So there's materialism as well. So it's gold and silver, and a massment of gold and silver. I find this as well in politics. Everything seems to go around the economy. This politicians' uh, concept about good and right, and about leading the nation into what is good and right punishing evil, recommending good, and that's all gone by the way. Uh, I find that in this country um, everything seems to be measure, measured by its economic benefits. So it's not really measured by, um, by, um, 
but but by whether it is you know it's a good thing or it's a bad thing, but just by the economic benefit. Yeah. There were there were talks. I don't think it's been happened yet, but talks about legalizing prostitution. And one argument was the the tax revenue you get. And and you think to yourself, okay, if it's legalized, how can you make this argument yeah, about just because of taxation to squeeze them for money for doing something which which isn't right and which is degrading to to themselves? Uh, and they might have been forced right through uh, whatever circumstances, but. It is, it's just a crazy world we're living in at the moment. And, and the biggest problem is people have lost the moral compass. And the moral compass used to be the Word of God, used to be the Bible. Uh, people had a respect for it, a healthy respect. They, they were using this as their guideline. And they've completely thrown it overboard. And they, they thought, it's irrelevant. It's an old book. We don't want to know about it. We don't want to know about God. We do it ourselves. Uh, and materialism, one answer. A lot of people are totally obsessed with materialism. Everything is about the economy. Everything is about trying to get richer. And one thing I find is the more this nation is trying to get richer, um, there are two elements you find. The one element is uh, everybody seems to get a little bit more poorer. You know, prices go up, wages go down. And uh, the next element is that um, there's a concentration of money to the top end. So the richer get a little bit more richer, and the poorer get a little bit more poorer. And the government doesn't manage to tax the rich, so it decides to tax the uh, poor even more because they've got all these programs and all these other things they need to do. So where do they get the money from? Uh, only from the ones who haven't got the means to try and hide it from the government or to have loopholes to try and move it around so that it becomes inaccessible to the government. Okay, it goes further. The, the, the land is full of idols, work of their own hands, you know, what's been made by their own fingers. And people humble themselves before these idols. And, um, and that is what, what I find as well. When you talk to people, people make up their own God. So it's no longer the God of the Bible, but it's some, some sort of God who uh, will be nice, who will be good, who, will, who is very loving. And true, God is loving, but what people forget is God is also righteous. There's going to be no evil in heaven. There's going to be no evil with God. And that's one of the things people forget. But yet, in people's minds, uh, the, the, the problem with righteousness is or justice, yeah, and the need of reconciliation is, is no longer there. God is nice, he's good, he's, he's a means to get rich, he's a means to, to get more chariots and more treasures and more gold. And even within the Christian era, you find um, the so-called evangelical or so-called Bible-believing Christian era, you find that the same, um, the same fallacy is preached as well, that, that, that people see God as a means to solve their problems, not as a means to enter into a relationship with or someone to enter into a relationship with and they need to be reconciled with and the ultimate judge of, of their destiny between heaven and hell. So we find that, that in our generation uh, people have got very strange ideas of God. They make up their own God, the God which suits them, the God which they want, the God which, you know, which they need for their own needs. They make them by their own hands and they bow down to that God and they worship that particular God. And you find this you find this all over the place. You find this in humanism, in agnosticism, and even you even find it within Christianity that uh, the God of the Bible is somehow put aside and we don't want to know. He's too too difficult. So we, we better make up our own God. Okay, um, there's a lot of arrogance. There's a lot of a lot of um, Strange stuff going on yeah, within society. People make up their own gods, but, but God says, no, it's going to get over. You know, This is not going to be for long. Uh, he's going to make an end to it all. He's going to put low everything which is raising itself up against him. And um, materialism is going to be brought down. You know? There's no question about this. One thing as well, and, and um, this is just a message to Europe and, and to, to America and, and everything else, and you can look at, at analysts, and every analyst says the same thing, that whatever is happening there, the, the wealth which is there, and you know the shift of manufacture to, to other countries, and uh, we're not producing that much anymore, um, is going to turn around and eventually we'll... Um, uh, the systems we, we've been trusting in is going, going to come to a collapse. Uh, finance and capital is going to go down. And um, things will, will change. 
and will go down and I think judgment is gonna is gonna hit Europe, it's gonna hit America. And and to be fair, I mean I hope when this time comes the people will will we remember, we remember the good things in the Word of God and we return to God. Ultimately, you're not talking about, you know, a few years on here, you know, to live in, um, in, uh, in good things, but you're looking, at, um, you're looking at other things as well. You're looking at eternity and spending eternity with God. If something in your life will prompt you to return to God, uh, you may lose your life, and you may lose your life in this world, but you'll gain eternal life with Christ. And, and not without Christ. Eternal life without Christ, which is the other option, is going to be most horrendous. And it's my warning for you as well, you should not even contemplate it. It's, it's horrendous. You should contemplate it in order to get to Christ. But, um, but it is horrendous. Hell is horrendous. Jesus in the New Testament talked more about hell than about paradise. So it's just something to bear in mind. And he warned from that. And he, con he described it as a, as a place of utter, utter horror and, and destruction. So if you think that Jesus was a good teacher, but not much more, think about those things Jesus said and, and take some action. Okay, I'm going to come to a close with this talk. Um, the last thing which we find, you know, that all the lofty and all the arrogance and all the things which put themselves up against God, they will be put down and they will come down. And, and may I say they will come down in a crush. Um, there's going to be the day of the Lord. Jesus will return. People will be afraid. They will be out of their minds. They will try to hide. They will hide in the ground. They will hide in the caves. And, and they just don't want to face this, this reality of Jesus coming back. Because they know what's uh, uh, what will be be happening to them, and one thing I want to tell you is when um, in your in your own life, you know, Jesus might come back today. He might come back. He might come back next year. He might come back in a um, in a generation. I don't I don't know. Yeah. Um, but ultimately, you in your own day, you will face Jesus one day, and you will face him, whether you want to or not. And it's your decision what you what you make of Jesus. Whilst you are here, whilst you've got the choice, whilst it is called today, what do you make of him? What do you make of it? Do you surrender to him? Do you surrender your life to him? What do you do? So our nations, the Occident, the um, in German it's called the Abendland, the, uh, it's called the Eveningland. I'm not quite sure it makes sense. We've got the Morningland, which is where the sun rises, the Eveningland where the sun sets, which is Europe and, and America. Uh, our nations have left God, our politicians have left the word of God. They have done their own thing and they are proud of it as well and they consider themselves of being you know, very hip and good. We have embraced stuff which isn't good, we have embraced Eastern religions. And when you really look and you analyze what these religions have done, they are very oppressive, they are very controlling, um, they are very damaging to, to human life and to society. Christianity in contrast. The opposite. If you look through history and you see what the Christianity has done, it's there's a lot. There are a lot of benefits. Uh, it elevated the. Uh, I'm not going to go through through all the benefits uh, because we're running out of time here. But there are a lot of benefits Christianity has done, from abolition to slavery to um, to to recognizing um, uh, you know, alleviating poverty to uh, to medicine to uh, lots of area education, etc many, many areas where Christianity has been active, uh, more so than, than any other religion historically. Um, and, and please, if you are um, a Muslim and you, you get really upset and all you can think about is the Crusades and, uh, and some of the stuff which happened re recently, I don't consider the Crusades to be part of Christianity. Um, and I don't consider uh, America or Europe to be a Christian nation in some of the stuff which is happening there. I don't think there are uh, Christian re re responses which has been happening to the Middle East. But, um, but there, there's a, an alternative, not an alternative history, but a, a parallel history when you look at Christianity and what Christianity has done over the centuries throughout the world. Um, they're quite amazing things uh, which were there in the realms of education, of freeing people, of empowering people, of, um, of medical care. Of, of charity and, and so on. Um, 
Okay. There's one final conclusion, and I'll uh, leave with this. And this is, uh, sever yourself from such a man whose breath is in his nostrils and of what account is he. And, and God makes a really bad statement, and he says, you know, what is man all about? Uh, what is he all about? Sever yourself from him. Man is nothing. You know, it's just breath in his nostrils, and, and what does he count for? Um, scriptures, other scriptures suggest to us not to put our trust in man. In the end, what, what is he? Uh, the answer is implied here. We need to trust God. God is real. You can experience him. If, if, um, if you look at this chapter, why, why sometimes God feels so far away and why God has removed himself from us, uh, we find the answer right at the beginning. It's because we have created all these idols. It's because we have created all our own gods. And God being a gentleman, if, if we reject God and we create our own concept, notion, ideas of God, God will just remove himself and he'll leave us to it. Um, <clears throat> we've got New Age, we've got strange Eastern religions, we've got Buddhism, Hinduism, New Ageism, Esotarianism, um, materialism, consumerism. Um, sometimes we've got our own ideas, but, but they're not necessarily God ideas. And if God is real, we need to uh, you know, strike, strike up a, a dialogue with the reality of God, with the real God, with God himself. All we can do is, all we can do, uh, and, and maybe just for a moment, maybe just for a moment, is to shake off these other gods. You know, shake off these ideas, and and just forget about them, just for a moment, and ask God, the Creator of heaven and earth, the Creator of yourself, just ask Him to come into your life and to guide you, to so that you can walk in His ways. Now, if if God is good, which He is by definition, He has to be. If God is kind, uh, if God is, is there, and you ask him into your life, he will come into your life. Um, the answer is, <clears throat> is Jesus Christ. You need to trust him for forgiving your sins and everything that has separated you from God. So you need to seek his forgiveness. And once you do this and you accept what Jesus did for you, that he took the punishment you deserve on the cross of Calvary, then the path between you and God is open, it's free. You can, you can go there, you can walk freely. The separation is away. The, the stuff that separated you from God, which is your idolatry, the gods you've made up yourself, the sin you've, you've done, the offenses you've done before God, all this is gone, is washed away by the blood of Christ. To sum this up, we need to turn away from, from crazy ideas for our lives. And um, all we have... All we have will, will not stand in the light of God when it appears, unless we have become part of this light. You know, in, in this verse in Isaiah, it talks about the light of God. Come into the light. This is what God is, what God is saying. Come into the light. You need to get into the light of God. To uh, Many things. If you come into the light of God, you can see all the things which are wrong. Otherwise, if you just grope about in darkness, you will not see them. And it's just a bit like uh, on a very bright day, um, at the moment in England, it's very cloudy and misty all the time and you don't see much. But on a very bright day, if you've got a white shirt, you can see the, the, the tiniest spot. On a dark day, it looks okay. It's no problem. It's the same with God. If you go into the light of God, you can see all the things which are really wrong in your life. And you can suddenly see the need of forgiveness and the need for forgiveness and reconciliation with God. And this is really what you need to get so that this barrier between you and God is taken away and you can make a new start with God. Now it's up to you. Uh, it's just a short message. I don't know whether you've listened. Maybe you've not listened. Maybe you have. Uh, it's quite a long message as well, so I don't know how far you can follow all this stuff. But it's, it's an interesting scripture. And it's, it's a scripture which, which attacks our zeitgeist, the spirit of this word. Zeitgeist is a German word, means whatever's happening, you know, the, the mood at the time or the spirit of this word. or. Um, whatever, or the spirit of time, you know, uh, however you may translate it. But at the moment, it's, it's just all posed against God. You know, People don't really want to know. They don't want to know about God. They want to have their own God. They want to be left alone. They want to sort of pursue their own lives and uh, you know, make a bit of money, be happy, consume. That, that's what people want, like this is all. But uh, the bad news is it's not all, or the good news. Um, this is just the beginning. And here you will decide where you will spend the rest of your time, whether you're going to be with God 
you know, in a place which you will enjoy, which is great, which beats anything you can have in this world, or you will be in torment for the rest of your existence in eternity. It's your choice, it's your call. Um, the Bible is there for you to read. It's a bit of a complex book, but the Spirit of God is there as well. All you need to do is just open yourself up, throw out all the gods and say, Lord God, I want you in my life. Come into my life, you know, show me who you are. Jesus, I want to believe in you. Let me see who you are and what you've done for me. And if you do this, you can have a new start and you can make a new start with Jesus. Um, so my last sort of appeal to you is, is don't follow the deception which is in this world. Don't follow the prince of this world who tries to deceive you, who tries to tell you that this is all a lot of rubbish. But, uh, but follow, follow and walk into the light of God and let God be your ruler. Let God be the one who leads and guides you through this life uh, for now and eternity. Okay, I'm going to leave, leave this with you. God bless and bye-bye. From Michael here at Radio Eden.